Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Tiki with Ray, and today we're going to do a little cartography, is that what you call that? Ah, wow, yeah, good good word. It's unbelievable that I was able to pull that word. Yeah, 25 cent word of the day. Yeah, because we've been drinking... Absinthe and Mai Tais. Absinthe and Mai Tais, and this is a the great... Breakfast of Champions. We're gonna be talking about some maps, yeah, and a couple other yeah. things. What? So what? What's so special about these maps? What? What, what are we talking? So about? we're talking about the Golden Gate Exposition of 1939. Treasure Island was a island. If uh, you've ever driven the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, mm-hmm. which is really two bridges from uh, Oakland to San Francisco or vice versa, yeah. the island in the middle where you go through the tunnel where it shifts from one type of bridge to the other yeah. was created sort of man-made landfill in the 1930s to host a, an exposition. World's um, Fair. Like a World's Fair. Yeah. The major theme of the exposition is called Pageant of the Pacific. You were talking about how the World's Fair in New York 1939. Right. Oh, yeah. that 39 was a very and 40, pop- right. That was a very popular one. Although there was the the Pan Am Clipper um, airplane that would go cross country. I don't know how many stops it would take. Yeah. Um, people couldn't easily hop to go to two fairs on both coasts. That's true. Back in 39, if you think about it. Yeah, that's very true. And we so, didn't have interstates yet. Yeah. No, we did not. So, yeah, you're right. If you were going to drive, even if you're going to drive... From New York City to San Francisco. So this oh. this exposition was centered on the Pacific because San Francisco then was seen as the gateway from the United States to the Pacific. So it had a very unique focus. Um, and the pageant of the Pacific was both uh, one of the themes. Yeah. And it was to bring together, unlike maybe a World's Fair, it was really more of a Pan Pacific Fair. To take countries, you know, all the way from maybe India all the way out to Brazil, but um, land masses that touch the Pacific Ocean. Okay. So parts of Asia, uh, Australia, you know, the Americas, both north and south. So what you're saying is this expedition was more focused on the people of these areas, where the New York World's Fair was more focused on like the, the inventions and like here's going to be the new things coming. Because I remember at the New York in the New York 1939 New York World's Fair, that's where the smoking robot. Yep. That, yep. You know, it was all about the um, Futurama. Futurama, a lot of Art Deco, f- futuristic looking buildings. Yep. Which is normally like what a World's Fair is. It's supposed to be like, hey, this is this is what the future is going to be bringing us. And you're saying that the exposition in San Francisco was more based on like, let's celebrate the people. That's the right. Peoples of these, of these of the Pacific of the Pacific or or peoples that touch the Pacific. So the pageant of the Pacific is a series of artwork, which are maps uh, that use the Pacific as the center. Okay. And so in the write up here, they're saying this is unique. Because um, whereas the the map that most most North Americans would look at in 1940 would it would usually cut the Pacific off, you know, and and feature of course it feature either the uh, Americas in the center or feature Europe and the Americas. Um, these artworks feature the Pacific and cut off the old world, so to speak. And artist Miguel Horaru. Yes, um, we should just call him uh, Miguel. Cora Rubius was um, a contemporary of Frida Kahlo uh, and Diego Rivera. Okay, and he was from Mexico as well. He was an artist who did a lot of uh, covers. He covered the Harlem Renaissance for magazines. If you were to see some of his artwork, it's very stylized. He was also a sort of an ethnographer. Not only was he an artist, but he looked, uh, or an anthropologist of sorts. So he and his first wife spent time in Bali, and he wrote a paper about the peoples of Bali. Okay. He was um, a, an avid <clears throat> student and actually wrote some serious papers about the um, Olmecs and the Mayans of Mesoamerica, okay. uh, which is why we, we have a Mesoamerican mug out here. Uh, to, 
We'll do an episode on these months yep. and a future date. Yep. But that's sort of the tie-in here. Um, so he was commissioned to build these huge maps for the World's Fair. Um, what he Plural. Did, plural. He did six of them. He did six of them. And I'm just looking up the height of them. They were uh, created in, as big uh, panels, so they'd be like uh, panels. And the maps were native dwellings of the uh, Pan Pacific region, yeah. which would be nine by 13 feet tall. So it was four big panels. Uh, trans- nine by four feet tall. Four th- nine by 13 feet 13 tall. 13 feet tall. Oh, these were huge then. Well, these are the small ones. Well, those are... Sp- and, the, and there's one on transportation, and we'll look at that as well. Yeah. And that was also nine by 13. Those are the two small ones, maps. The wow. big maps are Peoples of the Pacific, uh, 16 by 24 feet. It was 12 panels. Uh, the economy of the Pacific, Pan Pacific region, yeah, uh, 16 by 24. Again, the pageant of the Pacific was the theme. Flora and fauna, which was the most brightly colored of them, 16 by 24 feet. Yeah. And um, my personal favorite, the native art, uh, which is the one behind us, we're going to look at a, a, a replica of it, was also 16 by 24 feet. So it's hard to imagine 16 by 24 feet, how big That's, these structures were. That's huge. Yeah. And so, again, he was commissioned uh, as part of the theme. And so these are the pageant of the Pacific with these six maps that he created. And because of his, uh, the reason I, I go back into his background, and not only as an artist, but also... Uh, an ethnographer, I think is the way he would refer to himself, um, but a study of peoples and cultures. Yeah. Um, he actually had to decide what art or buildings or people's uh, native garb to represent. These were then, in 1940, they did some limited edition posters uh, that represented these huge... And that's what I was able to procure. So what I bought was the six... six posters from 1940 and you can find um people have done more contemporary versions of it so you can find inexpensive ones modern versions uh but just be careful if you ever look for them because sometimes people will take the modern versions and then try to sell them at the 1940 prices oh. so the difference between say 50 or 100 dollars a poster and hundreds so, so you have the actual posters from the 40s from the 40s yeah before we look at those yeah what do we got here? We, yeah, have some, we, me, have, we have some things laying on the table here. So um, we've got some things laying on the table because um, Greg and Justin at the last TikiCon convention in Portland. 2019. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Time flies. Yeah. Well, the theme was Pageant, Pageant of the Pacific. That's right. Pageant of the Pacific. Yes. And so I have the, the Mai Tai glass from... Pageant of the Pacific, and, yeah. and that's where they got the idea, huh? Yeah. But instead of a mug, they did a, a canister. So this is a Vantiki, though, right? And we're going to see what I think was the influence for this from the Pageant of Pacific artwork. This bar that we're at today, yeah. um, I like to say, if people ask me what it is, beyond just generic word tiki bar, yeah. is that I like to have both mugs and art representative of the Pacific Northwest, as mm-hmm. well as Papua New Guinea, as well as Brazil, as well as Cambodia, yeah. as well as lowbrow art. Yeah. So um, I call it Pan Pacific Pop Surrealism, uh, which is sort of a mouthful and a little pretentious. But that is, for me, the idea of Pan Pacific and not limiting myself to necessarily Polynesia. Well, well the idea is to celebrate these cultures. Yeah. And to show them off. Yeah. And then to show off the the pop art and the lowbrow art that may have been influenced by them or influenced by tiki culture in America and and mix it up with the uh, monkeys with fezzes and there you go to have the uh, the the poster uh, in this bar is the artwork of the Pacific which yeah. again is my favorite and so that's the direct tie into what we're doing here and why it's sitting behind us here today. Yeah, we'll, t- we'll take a look at it, but what are you, what are you fingering? There? Oh, what I'm fingering is I... What is that look Before, like? I had bought a number of years ago um, because there's not, uh, there's um, not as much uh, 
things as, say, the New York's World's Fair, or even the World's Fair from the 60s of Seattle or New York, in terms of memorabilia from the Golden Age Exposition. But fortunately, it at least a number of years ago, it was not as well trod as the World's Fair. Um, so you could get some good souvenirs. So this is something that I actually I wore to TikiCon, and it's a little pin. So yeah, this is real small. From the uh, 1939 ex exposition, and it features the main building. I forget the name of it now on Treasure Island, the, uh, which was the island they built for this exposition, and it says Golden Gate on it, and it's a golden uh, pin. Uh, it's just a little inexpensive there, trinket I picked up. There's just souvenir from the 1939. Yeah. Not not very big. Not I should be wearing big. it, but it probably wouldn't show on camera. Yeah, it, it wouldn't even show up. But uh, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful little, and it's the Art Deco styling. And I will and I will say this on YouTube: if there is some color footage from the 1939 exposition on YouTube, that looks incredible. And um, like I, I have a I have an interest in World's Fairs myself. And um, the, the 1939 World's Fair in New York, and then there's also this one. And anytime you find color footage, yeah, it's the closest thing you're gonna have to um, uh, like a time machine. It, it looked like an amazing, an amazing event. And um, well, let's check out these maps. Yeah, and let's do it. Let, let's see, let's see what these maps look like because I have a feeling that they're not gonna look like your typical map. No, no. and. Um, so we'll head back here to the first one, and Stephen, tell us Let's about talk, it. We'll talk about Art of the Pacific. All right. All right. So we're at the art forms of the Pacific area from the pageant of Pacific. So this is my favorite of the six maps. But you can see how the maps, number one, feature the Pacific landmass and Pacific regions. So we go from basically India all the way out toward Brazil. Uh, in terms of the land masses. And what's great about this is, again, the because um, Miguel, I'll call him, was a uh, et ethnographer, um, a an anthropologist of sorts, he studied on a lot of these cultures. Um, and so there's a lot that we can talk about and a lot of people can pick their favorites. Um, but we start with uh, the Sinhalese uh, uh, Hanuman, the monkey god, uh, a t Tibetan demon, uh, Khmer, which would be Cambodia. So some amazing things um, in terms of just the Asian art depicted. But uh, for those of us, you can see how Polynesia is, comes out in its own triangle. Uh, he didn't feature Micronesia on this, but Melanesia, Polynesia. Um, so we go from the classic tiki, the hey tiki, um, and then the canister we saw, Pageant of Pacific, I'm sure Van Tiki was inspired by this from, um, this is Rara Tongan, which, uh, but the uh, Cook Islands, I guess is what we would refer to this. And this was the Big Ears, uh, um, was it Rota Nui? Uh, Big Ears, um, a sculpture. And I'm sure that influenced the canister we saw. But you can see some other uh, for those of us familiar with Polynesian art, some other familiar things, tapa cloth, and of course, uh, the Easter Island. Um, and I also like what they picked for the Hawaiians. Um, some amazing things. And then here, we're in the Pacific Northwest. So this, I think, represents uh, a bent wood box and the intricate carving from the Haida people, which are just north of here, um, out there. One interesting thing is, a lot of these are very specific to islands or cultures, you know, because he could only pick one from each and from different time periods. So we're going all over the map. Um, because he was from Mexico and was a, um, a scholar of Mesoamerican, uh, Olmec in particular, um, um, and Mayan, he put Mayan uh, primarily in what is today Guatemala. But rather than pick Aztec, Olmec, Toltec, um, Zapotec, he put just Mexican, which is kind of interesting aesthetic choice on his part, uh, being Mexican. Uh, whereas when we get to the further mar, we have Hopi, Navajo, so we have uh, nations or tribes. Um, and then generic, the mound builders of the Mississippi, which uh, fascinated him as the artist. Uh, 
but uh, you can see the cartoonish nature of these, uh, the colorful nature of these, and to see these. So the, um, the posters today, this one was loaned out, all six of them were loaned out to New York in the late 50s. Um, and when they came back to the West Coast um, and later for exhibit uh, in Mexico, uh, this one, the actual was missing. So the, of the six huge artwork with the big dimensions we described earlier, this one is gone uh, and not to be found. It got lost in New York in 1959. Uh, so we'll never see this one big. The other ones are on storage. I don't know, they were gonna put them on display in Treasure Island. Um, one of them had been on display at the De Young Museum in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, but I think has been returned. So I'm guessing the other ones are in storage, but this one, this 1940 poster is probably the best we, can, we have. But my favorite, and again, the idea of tying all the art and culture into all the various art and culture that we have here is uh, what excites me and I'm glad to have it here. This is the second poster of the six we're talking about, the native dwelling of the Pacific area. And you see this is smaller than the last one we did because uh, when they did the 1940 reproductions uh, has the, the posters, um, I think they're lithographs, um, it says in the fine print somewhere, um, they actually made this one and the transportation one, which in real life were smaller. They made these posters smaller as well. Um, so my favorite, and so these are the dwellings. And again, the artist had to pick from different dwellings to be representative. Um, my favorite is again, the height of people up here in the Pacific Northwest to be uh, off of Vancouver Island, just north of where we are today. Um, and it looks like a, one of their longhouses um, that I think is terrific. Uh, some of the Asian, uh, some of the Asian uh, buildings are, are similarly uh, Pacific, uh, are, of the Pacific are similarly colorful and interesting. Um, and always a sense of humor. You'll see an indigenous uh, Australian uh, in his uh, dwelling unit out there. And uh, in, in Brazil, you'll see somebody on a, on a hammock. So um, again, a little bit of a sense of humor about these, but very impressive little details on what he selected here. And then turning over here on our hallway is the fauna and flora of the Pacific. And this one is probably the one that I would love to see uh, reproduced or if it hangs somewhere in San Francisco in the future, if it's not already, I'm not sure. I would just love to see this in its full 16 foot glory because you can say, even though this one was, was quite, quite faded a bit from the 1940s, the colors have somewhat survived and just an amazing amount of, of colors. And again, a lot of fun in what he picked. Well, also what he did, which I don't know if that was prevalent back then or not, was he took the different um, areas in terms of uh, forests, evergreens, tropical deserts, and brush. And so he tried to color code them as well to give you a sense of what the, the native vegetation, what their colors would have been. Um, and so we got the, the big redwood trees out representing our West Coast. And I'm a big fan of an Australia he got both monotremes, which are monotremes. Those are um, egg-bearing mammals, and the only ones are the duckbill platypus and the echidna. And he got both with a little egg in there. So um, on a lot of these, he really did his homework in terms of trying to, uh, to sort of know what he was talking about, not just culturally, although that was his forte, but also in terms of, of the animals. Uh, I'm sure there are some um, animal experts will find some anomalies in here, but, um, but that's okay. <laughs> I just think it's, it's really terrific and, and little details like that, like, like the monotremes just, uh, make this really special in terms of this artist doing his homework. Okay. So Ray is studiously avoiding the mess that is my home office. Um, but the artwork in my office, uh, is, uh, both cartoon and transportation theme. Everything in here is transportation themed. 
And so we took one of the posters, which is native means of transportation in the Pacific area, um, and put it in here because it, it fits the, the theme and vibe of this messy office. Um, so you see a lot of animal transportation, um, a lot of when we get to the Polynesian and Melanesian uh, areas, and even Micronesia is listed on here. Uh, you'll see a lot of interesting boats uh, that he's done. But of course, the most interesting form of cam conveyance, which was pretty exciting back in 1939, is the Pan Am Clipper right there. So an, a native means of transportation. I don't know about native, but means of transportation to span the Pacific to show the sort of moder modernity and future. Because one of the interesting things is when you read the booklet, which um, I had to get online, the booklet didn't uh, come with this set of posters I bought, is that in 1940, when they wrote the, the text that describes everything that's in this art, they were describing a, a changing sense of optimism into the winds of change. So obviously in Europe, but also in Asia. Um, when they planned the exposition, they were hoping for a brighter pan-Pacific future. And of course, uh, the winds of war, um, both uh, in Asia and in Europe, had already, had already come by 1939. Um, and so it, the text is fascinating to see the, the pessimism, uh, or I don't know, even the inevitability leading into World War II. But these, still have that sense of optimism and uh, that sense of uh, cross-cultural currency. And again, Pan Am Clippers are just really cool airplanes. The fifth of the six posters um, is the economy of the Pacific. We have not hung these up in our house yet. That's why we're displaying them here right now. So um, I've found this sort of less interesting in terms of the story it tells, but it, but Again, there's just lots of detail about what was deemed important economically in 1939, important, or how things were seen. So Hawaii and the pineapples, uh, different fruit products. But really for me, it's more the pictorial demonstration. I mean, look at how many pellets and furs. <laughs> there's a lot of repetition in here. And this iconic image, this is one of the iconic images of the pageant of Pacific artwork and posters is this. Um, and thankfully, the colors have survived quite nicely from a 1940s um, uh, painting in, in Teal here. But this one, um, I'm, I, I pay less attention to what the representation of the details uh, and more just the overall gist uh, of this and, and the colors. Um, it's one of those that I wouldn't stop and stare at forever, but it, it's pleasing out of the corner of my eye, if that makes any sense. So the last one is, uh, for many people, the piece de resistance. Uh, there's a, you can find a video online from the Los Angeles Public Library where a librarian takes you into the map room where uh, people can view these posters. They're laid out in the map. And the librarian says, this one is the star of the show. For me personally, it was the first one we looked at, the artwork, because of uh, my interests. But this one, uh, I guess, is the, the quintessential piece, uh, and it's the peoples of the Pacific. And so we find a representation of different uh, people over different points in time. Um, in terms of what people may have looked at, um, you know, there are different sort of uh, times that are represented here um, and there you know some of these may be seen as stereotypical um, for the area again for those of us who uh, are into the cultural history or the background that led to tiki we have polynesia micronesia and melanesia quite nicely called out uh, and sort of the ethnicity uh, in terms of people uh, in a way that probably we wouldn't describe them today um, in terms of their background and they came from. But um, Miguel uh, was not shy about 
uh, poking a little bit of fun at the West either. Um, so if you look, uh, my favorite representations are of people in the United States. In the Midwest, somebody who's a, maybe a mechanic. And on the East Coast in New York, what was seen as a businessman of the 1930s. And finally, we go to Hollywood and the starlet. I think there's a little tongue in cheek knowing the uh, stereotypical aspects uh, could be pointed not just at native peoples from many years ago, but of uh, contemporaries of his day. So my favorite is, is a little tongue in cheek in there. Um, but some brilliant uh, costumes, some brilliant design. Um, and again, like most of these other posters, you could just stare at for a long time and and get a lot out of it uh, with some humor uh, and some dignity and respect for, for these people. So although some of the descriptions might not be what uh, contemporarily we would, we would call them, um, it, it's, it's got a lot of interest. And knowing that the artist lived in Bali, lived uh, and was from Mexico and had studied native peoples, I think really helps uh, us appreciate it and relax a little bit about enjoying what's represented here. So yeah, a lot of fun. And again, happy to have these posters. Before we talk about the artwork itself, my tie-in is, uh, as you know, Ray. You're my tie-in. No, there you go. Nice. All right. Uh, 